morning, ACC. Welcome to another week of online church. We want to let you know about a couple of opportunities you have this week to get involved with our community. The first is that we are partnering with City Without Orphans to provide food and essentials for college-age foster youth um, that do not have adequate support because the colleges are closed. So if you're able to, on your next shopping trip, you could pick up some additional non-perishable food items, maybe some gift cards, um, toiletries, those would be great. And if you can bring them to the church on Thursday, we'll have a drop-off box set up outside. You can just drop those off and that it will be there available for you between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. on Thursday. The second opportunity we have is that I'm sure you're well aware is that many families are struggling during this pandemic financially. And so here's a way that you can help. Since it's the end of the month now, and if all of your bills are, have been paid this month, we would ask you to consider that with whatever you have left over in your abundance, that you would consider making a donation to our community relief fund so that we can help support families that are struggling. It doesn't have to be a lot. Um, does it, you know, any amount would be great. But if you want to do that, you can go to our website and click and give to the community relief fund. We also have a new check-in um, survey online on our online communication card. And that helps us know what kind of support you need, whether it's financial, emotional, spiritual. We want to make sure that your needs are being met. So if you could take the time to fill out that survey, that would be awesome. And then don't forget that after service, we are having our virtual lobby hangout time. So please make sure that when you log in, you enter your name so that we know who's in the waiting room and we can give you permission to enter. And we will see you after service.
and adults, how many of you have been grounded before? Or maybe if you're too young to be grounded that you've been put in timeout. In that moment, it feels like the worst, like you would do anything to get out of it. And some of you honestly may feel that way right now because you can't go out and hang out with friends or go out for entertainment. But unlike right now, usually when you get grounded, there's a good reason for it. So today, I want to hear what's the worst or funniest thing that you've done that has gotten you grounded. In Pastor Jason's message today, we'll hear about Paul and Silas in Acts. They did something that they weren't just grounded for, they were sent to jail. So Action Kids, I want you to see if you can figure out if there was a good reason for it and how their attitude was different than usually our attitude when we're grounded because I can guarantee you that the answers will surprise you. Welcome everyone, wherever you're watching from, we are so glad that you're here. And I hope that you're blessed and doing well. I hope that your bread is rising and all the pieces of your puzzles are accounted for. This past week, even I just finished the show, Psych, And I am absolutely so sad that it's over. But worse than that is that we now find ourselves in the dreaded show hole. This is not the place that you want to be when you've got no place to go. So help me out right now. Let us know that you're here today by telling us what you've been watching during quarantine. Maybe you can help dig me out of this thing. Let's take a moment and let's ask God to bless our talk today. That he would speak deeply to us through his words of scripture. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are with us. We thank you that wherever we are, wherever we're watching from, that place has become a holy place because you are there. We ask you, Lord, that we would see unexpected beauty from places that would surprise us today and in this quarantine life. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Now today marks the 38th day since the California shelter-in-place began on March 20th. That is a long time. That's long enough to grow a pretty decent beard. That's long enough to form some new habits and pick up on new behaviors. So I thought that it would be kind of fun today to play quarantine bingo with one another before we jump into today's message. So this is how you play. I'll read something, and if you've done it in the past 38 days, you get a point. The first person to five points, and then post those five things, they're the winners. It's pretty simple. So here we go. The first one is, in the past 38 days, you've made not just bread, but specifically banana bread. In the past 38 days, you've given yourself a haircut, and you regretted it. In the past 38 days, you played the game Animal Crossing. I have no idea what that game is, but supposedly it's going crazy right now. In the past 38 days, you began a vegetable garden. By the way, this is some long-term thinking. You are expected to be here for the long haul if you are thinking, hmm, these pro- this produce is going to see me through the winter. In the past 38 days, you've considered getting chickens so you'll always have fresh eggs. In the past 38 days, you've had to convince a loved one to stay inside or a loved one has had tried to convince you to stay inside. The past 38 days, you started watching the news on TV in real time. It's crazy. I totally forgot that existed until this past quarantine event took place. In the past 38 days, you signed up for a new streaming platform like Netflix or Disney Plus or Hulu. In the past 38 days, you got a new puppy. In the past 38 days, you've forgotten at least once what day of the week it is. Bonus point if you forgot what month it is. I seriously thought we were in March last week. In the past 38 days, you've watched the entire show, The Tiger King. I haven't seen it yet, but evidently, like Animal Crossing, that's another thing that's going on. Now, I'm going to assume right by now somebody's won. So if you are the winner, 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 chicken dinner, congratulations. You are quarantine queen or quarantine king of the day. The funny thing is, if I would have read this list in early March, I don't know that many of us would have done much of what's on it. Just showing us a little glimpse how much life has changed so suddenly. 
Life in quarantine has changed so much. The way we communicate to each other, the way we shop, the, the things that we do, even time feels different during this quarantined life. After 38 days of this, many of us are starting to feel the physical, spiritual, mental, and emotional effects of all this taking toll on our lives. I'm sure I'm not the only one out there who's lost it a little bit and snapped at a family member. I'm sure I'm not the only one out there who's felt the immense sadness of this disruption of our lives. I'm sure I'm not the only one out there who at times feel so frustrated with this myself because I'm not better at doing this, or I feel like I'm not doing enough. I'm sure I'm not the only one out there who is absolutely so sick of Zoom calls. It's not that I don't want to see the people who I'm talking to. I, I desperately miss them. I'm just sick of staring at a computer all the time. I'm sure I'm not the only one. Please, tell me I'm not the only one, right? Do you know how a pressure cooker works? Typically, water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. A pressure cooker has a lid with a locking mechanism on it and a rubber seal. It's designed so that none of the steam can escape once the water begins to heat up. That trapped steam, it actually changes the atmospheric pressure within the cooker by 15 pounds per square inch, which is quite a bit. And what this does is it causes the water to boil at 250 degrees Fahrenheit instead of 212. And the increased heat causes food that's trapped inside the pressure cooker to cook much faster. A friend, uh, a friend boasted this week on Facebook that her quarantine chili beans cooked amazingly in her Instapot so fast she couldn't even believe it. And I think this is a good picture of what so many of us are feeling right now. I've heard someone say that they feel like being cooped up as we are has made them feel like they're living in a pressure cooker with no place to go. The normal rhythms and routines of life that helped us keep somewhat balanced and normal, allowing us to let off steam, they've been disrupted. The heat is getting turned up, and we actually have no place to go. So you might be losing your temper quicker than normal. You might be seeing old flesh patterns reemerge, the ugly side of you, the dark side of you that you thought was dead long ago. You might be angry at yourself because you aren't holding it together like you used to. First of all, you're not alone. This pressure cooker feeling, it's actually quite normal right now. So recognize where this is coming from and give yourself grace in the moment because Jesus certainly does. He looks at you, he looks at me, he looks at us with compassion right now. But admitting you feel weak and defeated doesn't mean that you have to stay that way. This is why we're going to start this brand new series today called The Quarantined Life. In this series, we're going to look at how we can actually thrive in this new normal by turning our confinement into our sanctuaries. Just because things have changed doesn't mean that we can't rediscover new ways to thrive in body, mind, and soul during this time. This can actually be a season that God uses to make us flourish in our lives if we let him. So today I want to look at a story from the book of Acts. In it, we'll see the apostle Paul and his companion Silas found themselves in a high-pressure situation. We'll see what they did to turn their confinement into their own sanctuary of praise. The story is found in Acts 16. The background of it is this. Paul is, the Apostle Paul is on a missionary journey. He's accompanied by Silas and Timothy and Luke, the, at least all that we know of. Paul then has a vision of a man who pleads with him to go to Macedonia and to go and preach the gospel to them because they're in desperate need. So Paul and his companions left immediately in the middle of the night and landed in the city of Philippi which is in the eastern part of Macedonia, which is today Greece. This is the first time the gospel is actually preached in Europe. Immediately what happens, a businesswoman named Lydia hears the message of Jesus and gives her life to him. Conditionally, Paul and the others have a ton to be thankful for. 
things are going extremely well in this new endeavor. This is like how things were in our pre-COVID-19 days. The economy is great, unemployment is low, you could find eggs and toilet paper at the grocery store. It was the good life. But as we know, things they have a way of changing really quick on us. The second person to experience the power of God could not have been any more different than the well-respected businesswoman Lydia. This young girl was not only demon-possessed, but she was exploited by those who claimed possession of her. They used her to make actually a boatload of money because the spirit inside of her would tell people's futures. Interestingly, the evil spirit recognizes Paul and his companions and says, this, it says, these men serve the Most High God and they know the way to be saved. Verse 17. For days, she followed Paul and his companions around, yelling this again and again and again. But here's the thing. The right thing in the wrong time is the wrong thing. Truth is always meant to be preached in love, not as a weapon. And this is what's going on here. Even though that she was speaking the truth, this truth was without love. And therefore, it was being used to become a distraction. Picture it. Paul and the others are trying to tell people about God, and Demon Child is behind them day after day shouting, these men know the way to be saved. They are from God, again and again and again. So what happens is Paul finally has enough. He's exasperated by this. And so what he does is he casts the demon out of this girl, and he saves her from a life of exploitation. But the problem was for her owners... But she was now no longer of value to them. And that was a major problem. And that became a problem for Paul and Silas. Listen to verses 29. I'm sorry, 19 through 24. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs of unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. And they had been severely flogged, they had been thrown in prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. Talk about a bad day. I, here they were doing good, doing good for God, and they're falsely accused and not given a fair trial. They're then stripped and beaten and humiliated. Sound familiar? It oughta. They were being treated exactly how Jesus was treated. They were then thrown into an inner cell of a prison which had no light. This is like the supermax of the Roman cells in those days. And then they were fastened to stocks where their feet couldn't move. Now, notice all of this happened to who? Paul and Silas. What about Timothy and Luke? Where'd they go? How'd they get off so easy? Well, Paul and Silas were being racially profiled because they were Jews. Luke was a Greek, and Timothy was half Greek, half Jew. So to add insult to injury... Paul and Silas were suffering because, because of other people's racial prejudices. Conditionally, you can't get much worse than the day these guys have had. Their confinement was designed to inflict unspeakable misery upon them. These guys had every right to groan and complain. I mean, imagine for a moment, step back. What if this was you? Imagine yourself sitting in the dark with your feet shackled in the stocks. Imagine had you been stripped and beaten for following God nonetheless, not because you did anything wrong. How would you feel? What would your disposition be? Would you grumble? Would you complain? I, mean, I don't know that anybody would blame you if you did. I don't know that anybody would blame these guys if they did. It would be even understandable if they were even angry at God, wouldn't it? Here they were doing God's will, and this is what they get for it. Do you ever feel like that? Have you felt like that recently? Has it seemed like God has dealt you and maybe all of us an unfair hand? 
that's easy to justify negative behavior, negative responses? See, thankfulness is the very last thing on your mind when things like this happen. While it's understandable, it doesn't mean it has to be the way we respond. Our joy, our peace, our capacity to flourish and thrive does not have to be bound by our health or sickness, riches or poverty, abundance or needs, or even our freedom or our confinement. So how does Paul and Silas respond when they're under this kind of incredible pressure caused by unjust sufferings? Listen to verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. All right, so they've been beaten, stripped naked, and they're in the stocks in the inner cell of a prison without light. And what are they doing? We find them praying and singing praises to God. Rather than letting their situation throw them into despair and crush them, they use their situation as an opportunity to praise God. See, what we see here is that gratitude is a powerful tool to turn our confinement into our sanctuaries. Now, granted, this is not always easy to practice, especially in, under challenging times, because for most of us, this is not our natural disposition. But it's proven again and again and again that gratitude is one of the best antidotes to negative emotions of fear and dismay. This means... Even if this doesn't come easy, gratitude must be chosen in our life. When you feel the heat turning up in your life, you can let your circumstances overwhelm you. You can allow yourself to go to that boiling point where you melt down. Or you can release the pressure before you start boiling by choosing to turn to gratitude and praise. If you do, you will experience what Paul and Silas experienced here you'll experience the strength and the joy of the Lord in the midst of your unwanted circumstances. So take a moment and think about something right now in your life, in this quarantined life that you're thankful for. What is it? Post it in the comment as a way of expressing gratitude and thanksgiving to God in these times so we can all rejoice with you. There's something else that's incredibly, incredibly powerful in turning our confinement into our sanctuaries, and that's the power of community. Paul and Silas had each other. Thank God for that. God graced them with each other. Like soldiers in trenches, they could endure anything that they went through because they could always lean on each other. This realization that you're not alone, it's a very powerful tool and an enormous reason to remain grateful right now. Do you have even one person in your life who you can walk through all of this with? If you even have just one, you're a blessed person. Look at the people that you're under quarantine with right now and see them as a gift, annoying behaviors and all, everything about them. Look at them and see them as, some, as someone that God intentionally placed in your life right now for your joy and pleasure and your stability. If you do this, you'll likely stand in greater solidarity with those people, and you'll stand more united through whatever we have to walk through. Brene Brown recently released a podcast, and in it, this, in it she made a powerful point. She said this, both anxiety and calm are extremely contagious, meaning the way you respond to a situation has the power to lead others in the same response, for better and for worse. This means that we can lean on each other right now to keep one another calm and grounded in a kingdom reality. If one of you is freaking out, don't shame them, but don't join them either. Allow your calm to lead them back into a healthy place. I don't know how the spontaneous worship service began in the prison cell, but most likely it began because one of them started it and the other one joined in. I can actually picture them in those moments, sitting there, and one of them says, this sucks. And the other one says, it sure does. But you know what? What? The joy is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And the next thing you know, they're both singing, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I 
doubt that was the song they sang, but you get the point. One moment, one of them started singing and praising God, and the next moment, the other one joined in. This is an example how, how mere neurons work. Your brain is, is wired to respond in a way that matches another. So if a baby, example, if a baby smiles at you, you almost can't help but to smile back at it, unless you're a hard-hearted jerk. One of these guys began to pray and worship, and he set a new tone in the prison, and the other one began to follow. But that's not all. It says that the other prisoners were listening to them. Now, notice what happens here. They're in a dark, dank prison with some of Philippi's absolute worst convicts, and you'd think that they would be booed in this moment. The minute Paul or Silas began singing, you'd think you'd hear somebody say, Hey, shut up over there. We're trying to sleep. But that's not what happens. People are listening. They were attentive to their prayer and to their praise. You see, when we suffer, people are watching. But when we express gratitude and praise to God through it, people are truly listening to us in those moments. Gratitude just, just doesn't lift you up out of the power of your circumstances. Yes, it does do that. But it will also transform you and everyone around you who's listening. Let's see what happens next. Verse 26 through 27. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. All right. What happens when jail doors open and shackles fall off of inmates? They run. They always have. They usually always will, except in this situation. This guard knew that his goose was cooked when his only job was to make sure these guys are right here in the morning. And now surely he knows they're gone. What takes place? Facing his own hopeless situation, the guard doesn't break into spontaneous prayer and praise, but he reaches for his sword. He couldn't see past his circumstances, and the, and the despair nearly destroyed him. But God loved him too. Just like God loves Lydia and the little girl, God sent Paul and the others for the Macedonian guard as well. Verses 28 through 32. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. Now, it's crazy to think that Paul and Silas stayed put it's even crazier to think Paul and Silas and all the other inmates stayed put. But they did. They managed to keep everybody from leaving in this moment. Something happened that night through their prayer and worship. They established spiritual authority with the other inmates that were present. The other inmates were willing to stay because the guys who sing and make earthquakes happen said to stay. But why didn't they leave? They stayed because gratitude expressed through prayer and praise, it tuned their hearts to God's heart. And God's heart was for the jailer. So they didn't exit their situation prematurely. If they did, then all their suffering would have actually have been in vain. It would have been wasted. What this means is the earthquake was not for their freedom, but it was for the jailer's freedom. See, God wanted to show himself to the jailer and prove that the, that the little girl's, girl's words were actually right. It was truth. These men are servants of the Most High God, and these men do know the way to be saved. Surely the little girl's words were coming to his mind, because what is the first thing that he does when he comes to them and falls on his knees? He asks them how he can be saved. He knew that God sent these men to him. So through the earthquake, he experienced God's incredible strength and power. But even more, it was because they stayed that he experienced God's amazing grace through Jesus Christ. See, right now, 
we need to give each other boatloads of grace. In doing so, we can help one another experience God's goodness. If we demonstrate kindness and goodness and grace to one another, even when we really don't deserve it, when we find ourselves at a boiling point and the worst of us is coming out, we need the other to give us grace. None of us have been through something like this before. This means we're all going to need this grace extended to us at some point. So be patient with each other. Give grace to one another. And our confinement will feel more like a sanctuary right now than a prison, a house of joy, more than a place of sorrow. Now, there's a deep lesson here. Don't jump from the exit until you know that that's the door God is leading you to. When we go through tough situations, it's easy to look for the exit and look for a way out really quick instead of looking to see what God might actually be doing. My prayer right now for us is not that this quarantine will come to an end tomorrow so that we can get right back to the way life was. My prayer is for us is that this will not come to an end until we've learned everything that God wants us to learn from it so that we won't go right back to the way things were before this all began. We absolutely must not waste this. We must be changed by it. We must use this time to see what God is doing in us and around us. So therefore, let us not be too hasty of running for the exit. What could God be teaching you right now in this? What is he renewing in your home right now? Maybe God wants to renew your marriage through the season of confinement together. Perhaps the pressure could turn your marriage more into a diamond than it will destroy it. Maybe the confinement is about getting to know the people who, in, or, who are in your home once again. Maybe this confinement is about renewing a lost passion because now you actually have time to write or read or plant or build or tinker. Maybe, and most importantly, this confinement is purely about finding your soul once again through Jesus Christ by renewing that relationship with Jesus. It could be all of the above and so much more. Whatever it is, don't rush towards the exit of this until you've found everything that God wants to do in you and through you from it. Verses 33 through 36. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God. He and his whole household When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their their officers to the jailer with an order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can leave. Go in peace. I love this because what do we see? Remember, calm is contagious. There's this cascading effect that we see in this story. What happens when we choose gratitude in spite of our pain? Not only does it gratitude ground Paul and Silas in calm over over anxiety and despair, but what we see here is it brings joy into the life of the jailer and his entire family. See, what Paul and Silas had in Christ, it was actually passed along to this entire home. This home became a sanctuary of praise because of their choice to turn their prison into one. What this means is that there is incredible potential to change generations in ways you'll never know because of these trials right now, because of enduring through them through gratitude. Your children's children can be blessed because you choose gratitude in Christ right now. That is an amazing thought. Now, I want to close by looking at another part of Paul's letters. Years later, Paul wrote a letter to his friends in Philippi. Listen to his words in light of what he experienced in the story in the, Philipp- in the Philippi jail that we just read. Imagine being the jailer or one of his family members listening to these words based on what he had seen and experienced in Paul during this time. Philippians 4, 4 through 13. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. What have you learned or received or heard from me or seen in me? Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Verse 11. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. I can picture the jailer and his family who are likely part of this church who Paul was writing to years later, hearing these words of Paul and saying, yep, sounds like Paul. See, what is Paul's secret? He says, look for the good around you. It's there. God will never de deprive us of complete beauty. There is always beauty around us if we look for it. Secondly, fix your eyes on Jesus and worship him in prayer and thanksgiving no matter what is going on in your life or no matter what's not going around in your life right now. Third, don't set your thoughts on that which you have no control of, but rather think of those things that are lovely and good and true. And in doing so, Paul says, you'll find your strength in the one who gives you strength to live this way. So what are some of the secrets of staying strong under this unique pressure that we're all going through? What have you discovered? If you have some tips that the rest of us could th use to thrive in this quarantine life, please place them in the comments below. We would love to see what's helped you. And perhaps those, those examples can help us. But I'd like us to end, this, end today with a challenge. The challenge of this whole series is to turn our homes, these places of temporary confinement, into places of praise and peace, into a sanctuary. So as a symbolic act, I'd like to challenge all of us in creating a stained glass window in our home, using painter's tape, tape out a stained glass design, and paint each sec section using vibrant colors. We'll have more detailed instructions on our Facebook page and Instagram page. But, but keep it up throughout the, dur dur the duration of the entire quarantine to remind yourself that your home is indeed your sanctuary. What this means is your home is a holy place and those who live in it are sacred. When we're reminded of these things, I fully believe we'll begin to act upon them and we'll find the strength and the joy of the Lord. Let's go ahead and close with prayer. If you'd bow your heads with me, I'd like to pray blessing in your life, strength and peace and joy and gratitude that it would bubble over in your life instead of the pressure and the negative effects of this quarantine life. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful for your grace to carry us in these unprecedented times. We're so, so thankful that you have surrounded us with people who love us and a community of faith to uphold us in these times. We are so thankful for the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask right now that you would forgive us of grumbling. That you would forgive us of having a bad attitude, of not doing the things that Paul instructs us to do, to lift our song to you, to pray to you in thanksgiving and gratitude, to offer all of us in this time as a living sacrifice to you. Lord, I ask that every single one of us would not feel rushed to exit this time in our life, no matter how uncomfortable we may be, until we have found the reason of what you're doing in our own personal lives. I pray that each and every one of us would be refined by this time and our faith would shine brighter than it ever has because of these days, that we would learn the secret of being content in everything, in freedom or in confinement. And I pray, Lord, that the world that is watching us, whether that be our children or our neighbors or our friends on Zoom, I pray that they would see your Holy Spirit in and through our lives and their lives would be transformed because of it too. We thank you once again that you are with us and never will you leave us or forsake us. 
So Lord, I pray that our homes scattered throughout these cities, scattered throughout the state, maybe even the world, become places of sanctuary, of prayer and praise in these quarantine days. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. All right, ACC, may God bless you. May his face shine upon you. Stick around as we lift our song together in worship, and then stay tuned at the end for the Three Strand guys to close us up. Peace, bring it all to peace. The storm surrounding me, let it break out. Let your name still, call the sea to still, the rage in me to still, every way. At your name, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, free. All these bones to live, all these lungs to see once again. I will praise Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, 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 you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus, you silence fear, Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus.
Jesus, Jesus, silence fear God. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus. All right, I think we've got the schedule ready for youth group on Wednesday night. What else are we missing, baby? I think we still need a crazy food challenge, don't we? That's oh. what I'm looking for right now. No, I already looked up our food challenges. Uh, I just Googled teen food challenges that are dope. Uh, here's what I came up with. Uh, the first one is, I guess you put Mentos in a Coke bottle. I guess you chug it. Uh, I think that's supposed to be a science experiment. Oh, not a food challenge. Okay. Um, Oh, how about this one? It's called the cinnamon challenge. You just take heaping spoonfuls of cinnamon and you just ingest... What? People go to the hospital all the time with that one. Okay, well, this is a great one. There are these little things called Tide Pods. And you, it's called the Tide Pod Chef. Oh my goodness. You know what? We'll figure it out. But in the meantime, join us on Wednesdays for Three Strands and we'll see if we can keep Robert alive. What? Thank you.